Hi guys. I'm not going to go through all of the notes of states of, of states of matter and thermochem with you. If you want like just a printed list of what goes in these blanks, there is a PDF um, version of that in the Google Classroom for you and you can check that out. Um, but I do want to go really, really quickly over this phase diagram and then talk about how to work through those heating and cooling curves. So this phase change diagram is used to help us determine what will happen at different temperatures and pressures for any given um, substance. Every substance has its own phase change diagram um, because it res the, every substance responds a little bit differently to temperatures and pressures. So I just kind of want to run through and make some things clear for you. Um, Any time I have a substance that is exactly on one of these lines, so for example, this substance, temperature and pressure would be whatever this combination is. So when I'm on this line, what is happening at that point is that I have some of this substance that's in a solid state and some of it that is in a gaseous state. It's literally going through this phase change, turning into a gas through sublimation and turning into a solid from a gas through deposition at the same time. This is called phase equilibrium. The same thing is true of here. In this spot, any place along this entire line, this substance would constantly be changing back and forth from a liquid to a gas through either vaporization or condensation. And finally, the last one, same idea again, anywhere along this line, my substance is constantly moving back and forth between a solid and a liquid, melting and freezing, so on and so forth. Again, all of these lines are called phase equilibrium. If I'm not at a phase equilibrium, then I would end up someplace in one of these kind of open areas of my graph. It doesn't matter where I end up, anywhere in this area that's called solid. As long as I'm not on a line, anywhere here, I would be a solid. The same is true for the other two sections. Anywhere in this long gaseous part, any combination here of temperature and pressure that ends up in this section would be a gas. And finally, any combination of temperature and pressure, oops, I don't want to do blue again, that'll blend in. Any combination of temperature and pressure that ends me in this entire section, anywhere in here, would be a liquid. The really cool spot on this graph is called the phase equilibrium, or I'm sorry, it's the triple point. I already told you about phase equilibrium. I'm losing my mind. The triple point is where these three come together. To get a little bit better idea about what a triple point looks like, you should go check out the video that's here, and there's a link to it in the Google Classroom as well, so you can see what it looks like when a substance is undergoing phase changes so that it has a solid, a liquid, and a gas all in the same place, all at the same time. So that's a super quick rundown of phase diagram. If you've got questions or you want me to go specifically, how do I read it and find out what something would be, um, you can come by. You should probably try before you do the questions that are down here at the bottom of your notes. See if you can get those. If you get those answers, again, you can check them with the PDF of my notes that's already in the classroom, then you're in good shape. And if you're not sure how I got any of those answers, definitely come by and ask your closest chemistry teacher. Heating and cooling curves are kind of the micro version of that big phase change diagram. So in a heating and cooling curve, what we're looking at is exactly what is happening during different points while I'm either adding energy or taking energy away from a substance. The first thing that you need to be aware of is that these should always have labels. They're graphs. Graphs without labels don't tell me anything. So the temperature should always be on the y-axis, and a combination of heat or time or both should always be on your x-axis. So that you can see these a little better, I'm going to do lots of different colors. If that makes you sad, I'm sorry, but it makes it easier to kind of see what's going on. So, so that you can see these pretty clearly, what I have is a solid down here, and I've kind of connected the dots of all of those particles. This one, in solid state, this substance has IMFs that are holding all of these particles together. They're typically much stronger here than they are here or here which has to do with the amount of energy that it takes to either wiggle those loose or to break them. In a solid state, if I'm adding energy, and that's indicated by my temperature increase here, and we'll talk about that again in a sec. So I'm adding energy, adding energy to a certain point where my solid reaches its melting point. 
This plateau is represented by the phase change that's happening. Melting isn't magic. It takes a minute. Think about an ice cube. I start with a solid ice cube, and it doesn't just magically turn into a liquid. It takes time. So the time that that ice cube is melting is indicated by this plateau. So I've got some that's a solid and some that's a liquid going on during this time. Once all of that ice has melted, then my temperature can shoot up again. So I'm going to use a slightly what I think of as a warmer color. So let's see if I write in this yellow. You guys can see it. Oh, yeah, great. So I'm going to make this be yellow. And if I can spell liquid correctly, there we go. I've got a liquid in here. And again, just to kind of show you where my particles are here. Okay, my particles are slightly more separated. The IMS that are holding them together are slightly weaker. And these molecules can move around a little more. They're going to continue to move around, move around, move around. I'm going to know that because my temperature is increasing. Remember, temperature measures average kinetic energy. So as these particles continue to move faster and faster, my temperature will go up, up, up until I get to a certain point. At this point, I will start to vaporize. This is called vaporization. During vaporization, some of my substance will be in a liquid state and some will be turning to a gas. That continues to happen until all of my particles are now in a gaseous state, so I don't have any liquid left, and now everything is a gas. In this phase, I don't really have connected together so much as all of these particles kind of floating around doing their own thing. Okay. So this going up, I'm going to be adding energy. So let me grab another color. When I'm going up the curve, I'm adding energy. Even during these plateaus, I'm still adding energy even though my temperature isn't changing. I'm just using that energy to go through a phase change. So this is endo and my delta H should be positive. When I'm coming down the other way, so if I'm a gas and I'm going to condense into a liquid, condensation, so I'll go from a gas to a liquid. When I get in everything to a liquid, my temperature will drop as those IMFs are getting stronger and those particles are getting closer together until I get to a certain spot, and at that spot, my substance will start to freeze. So when I get to here, these will start to freeze, freeze, freeze. I have some liquid and some solid. And then once I get down here, all of it will be a solid, and I have those stronger IMFs holding that together again. When I'm going up the curve, my temperature is increasing. That's considered to be an input of energy, so my change in energy will be positive. When I'm coming down the curve, this is exothermic, and my change in energy is considered to be negative. This is especially important when you start laying the math on top of this, like as in the second video, so that you can have an idea of what those heats of fusion and vaporization should be. To give you a quick reference, when I'm going up the chart this way, melting is considered endo, it's positive. When I'm going up the chart, vaporization also should be a positive input. When I'm coming down, oops, I made that red instead, that's not a big deal. When I'm coming back down, condensation is considered to be negative, as is freezing. The other things that might be useful for you to know and have an idea of, these diagrams are not exactly specific. They're not a science. There's not a certain degree that this needs to increase or a certain amount of time that this needs to plateau. These are a general sketch of what is happening. In this general sketch, this first plateau, let's see if I can get this straight. This is the melting point and is the representative of both the place where melting begins and freezing ends. This top part will be reported to you as TB, which is the boiling point. If you have questions about how these work, oops, I want to add one more little thing. Just as a general reminder, the plateaus, that means the flat part, so here and here. Those plateaus are where we're having a phase change. I'm going from solid to liquid or liquid to gas or so forth. This means that potential energy changes, but that potential energy is being used to wiggle those IMFs here, so we're bending them and now we're loosening them, and here we're breaking them. 
that takes a lot of energy. So let me add that in here real quick, just in case. Up here, when I'm vaporizing, in this section, we are actually breaking those IMFs. We're snapping those connections between these particles so that the gas particles can be free to move independently. So here we are breaking IMFs. Whereas here, let's see where I can put this. I'm starting to get a lot of stuff on this graph. Whereas here, I'm just loosening them. I see this in my picture. I've got a solid to a liquid. The particles are still reasonably packed together. They just have more motion in the liquid than they do here. So I'm considered to be loosening. This one takes a lot more energy because I'm breaking them. And then these particles act more independently of each other and they have more room to move. All right, so if you've got other questions, if you have more questions about how this works or what's happening in each part, please find your closest chemistry teacher and let one of us know. If you've got questions about the math, please see that separate video. Have a great day.